crisis with the future of food later at nine. Now on BBC Two, a new series, Saving Britain's Past. Since World War II, Britain's towns and landscapes have been transformed. The modern world has brought radical change and progress. It has also threatened to destroy historic buildings, countryside and centuries-old ways of life. People have fought back to save their heritage. The battles that have been won and lost reveal our changing attitudes to the past, present and future and have shaped how Britain looks today. It all began with the Blitz. In the early 1940s, Hitler sent the Luftwaffe to destroy cities, break morale and pave the way for Nazi invasion. The deadly nighttime air raids left a trail of devastation and fear. Town squares, medieval streets and ancient cathedrals were all in the firing line. When the beautiful city of Bath was attacked in April 1942, it seemed nowhere was safe. As the bombing continued, panic spread over how to protect Britain's heritage and preserve what was left for future generations. Out of this crisis came the energy and desire to save all of Britain's most important buildings. Choices would have to be made. What to hold on to? what to let go. But would these decisions be enough to save Bath, Britain's most precious city? Bath is the jewel in the crown of British cities. It was built during a golden age for British architecture. In the 18th century, this provincial town was transformed from the site of an ancient Roman spa to a beautiful metropolis devoted to pleasure. It became the place to see and be seen. The world of Jane Austen's novels was born here. Bath's architectural renaissance began with the buildings designed by John Wood. His ambition was nothing less than to revive the splendour of ancient Roman cities. Queen Square was made up of terraces that looked like palaces. The Circus, a forum for games. And after his death in 1754, John Wood's son put on the finishing touch the Royal Crescent. What John Wood began, other architects continued, creating a city of unmatched glory, order and scale. What makes Bath so special is that it was built in a little over a hundred years in one architectural style and using the same honey-coloured stone. It's this unity and harmony that makes it one of the most beautiful cities in the world. To the Georgians, it was a beauty that served society. Everyone and everything had its place. While the residents of the Royal Crescent enjoyed a sense of privilege and grandeur, out of view were the humbler buildings. Homes of the tailors and merchants, craftsmen and carpenters. In Bath, the English class system was set in stone. Until the 20th century, it remained one of the most complete historic cities in Britain. And while Bath today may seem like the perfect architectural gem, these buildings hide a surprising tale of destruction. The Luftwaffe's bombing raids over Bath in April 1942 had wrecked 19,000 buildings and left over 300 completely destroyed. Houses in Queen Square were flattened. The Royal Crescent was hit. And buildings in the circus were bombed out. 
Ruth Haskins was 21 when she witnessed the attacks. The whole place seemed to be on fire. And even the sky was blood red. And just occasionally, in between it all, you just got a glimpse of Bath Abbey because flares lit it up. And then you could see it for just a second. And I really thought that when it was over, there would be nothing left of the city of Bath. The bombings were part of a series of attacks that became known as the Baedeker Raids. Targets chosen by Hitler because of their write-up in Baedeker's Tourist Guide to Britain. York, Exeter, Norwich, Canterbury and Bath were all hit not for military or strategic reasons. They were bombed because they were beautiful. Baedeker describes Bath as unrivaled among provincial English towns for its combination of archaeological, historic, scenic and social interest. Now Hitler of all leaders knew about the power of architecture to inspire or demoralise a nation. After all, architecture was central to his plans to rebuild Germany. He must have looked at this and thought, destroy this gem and I'll destroy a, a whole nation's spirit. The King and Queen have come to see how Bath now takes its place in Hitler's plan of war. Once again, the distorted German mind conjures up hopes of breaking British morale. And to revenge the huge losses to their war machine, which we cause, the Germans turn the pages of a traveler's reference book and pick out our beauty spots and historic landmarks for destruction. The response to the devastation of Bath and other cities was swift. Poet and conservationist John Betjeman led the way when he proposed the idea for a national buildings record, a body that would photograph and document historic buildings across the country. At the same time, the Ministry of Works devised a salvage scheme. In every bombed out city, they appointed architects to make lists of buildings that needed urgent repair. The destruction also triggered a radical and long-term plan for the future. Incredibly, before the war, Britain had no centralised system for protecting its best buildings. In typical British fashion, it was left to a few disparate bodies. But the war changed all that. It triggered a sense of collective ownership over our national treasures, part of the same drive that inspired the welfare state and the NHS. From now on, what Britain looked like would be defined by the state. In 1944, a wartime town and country planning act was passed. Integral to this act were the lists, the first ever national inventory of buildings of historic and architectural importance. Most houses on the list were marked down for protection for the first time. And the whole idea of a listed building was born. These lists would have greater consequences for Bath and the rest of Britain's buildings than all of Hitler's bombs. In the late 1940s, the Ministry of Works appointed 30 men and women to become the first buildings investigators. One of them was William Collier. We had to list the whole of England and Wales, uh, the historic buildings. It was something that hadn't been done since uh, the 11th century, since Doomsday Book. And so it was really going into the unknown. We were architectural historians. Uh, it was something that hadn't been uh, a proper profession before. It was just an enthusiasm. But it was very much up to us individually to make these lists. Many investigators were Oxbridge educated and looked at buildings with an academic eye. They ranked them on the grounds of architectural rarity and distinction. To achieve a top billing, a building had to be unique, or one of the very best examples of a particular style. Grade one was for exceptional buildings, like the Royal Crescent, which should be preserved at all costs. Grade two was for architecturally interesting buildings, which could be altered with planning permission. And the final grade three 
was for buildings that had some architectural quirk or peculiarity, suitable for workers' cottages. This class had no legal protection. With so many historic buildings, tough choices had to be made. We awarded Grade 3 status to buildings which just didn't quite come up to scratch. But we weren't going to ask the local authority to go out of their way to preserve them. So when the first lists for Bath were published in 1947, the Georgian set pieces were classed grades one or two. Everything else was left unprotected. Unwittingly, what the listers had created was an open invitation for a new breed, the town planners, to start wielding their power. They were full of a post-war optimism for radical change and progress. The Blitz gave the impetus not just to save Britain's past, it also provided the perfect excuse to rebuild for its future, sweeping away the defunct old country and starting afresh. The trailblazer of the town planning movement was Patrick Abercrombie. He was recruited to redesign bombed out cities like London, Plymouth and Bath. In all devastated cities, there are some people who long for the past. They would like to see their town rebuilt exactly as it used to be. But of course, where there's been so much destruction, that's out of the question. Now, would somebody switch off the lights, please, and we have some pictures. Abercrombie believed that modern architecture could be imposed for the common good. That new buildings and roads would help create a better society. His idea was to divide cities into zones, each with a different function. His designs left plenty of room for the motor car and healthy open spaces. In February 1945, an exhibition of Abercrombie's plans for Bath was shown at the city's main art gallery. People came to see the exhibition in their droves. In fact, it got so busy they had to close the galleries to prevent overcrowding. What people were thronging here to see was nothing less than Bath transformed for the modern age. Bath would be divided into ten separate zones, with a ring road around the centre. There would be a grand concert hall, new bus station, and plenty of new homes. These are the original 1945 plans for Bath, and they're incredibly bold. Here's the Royal Crescent of all places, turned into a civic centre with a dual carriageway running past. Abercrombie was reworking an entire city. To make way for Abercrombie's ambitious plans, some buildings would have to be sacrificed, whether they were listed or not. He wouldn't regard listing as meaning that a building necessarily had to be preserved. There was no, no sort of preservation of the building in aspect, as it were. Uh, nor that it couldn't be altered, but you should think carefully about what you did and the manner in which you did it. Abercrombie thought many old buildings had simply outlived their usefulness. He pointed out that a lot of the houses were built in Jane Austen's day and they were suitable for people in the kind of living conditions that Jane Austen described, but those conditions did not prevail in 1945 or the years onwards. Abercrombie's ideas about what to save would seal the fate of many of Bath's unprotected buildings. Those listed grade three were like lambs to the slaughter. Though many of Abercrombie's grand ideas were too expensive ever to see the light of day, others simply wouldn't go away. The council embraced Abercrombie's zones for housing. That meant bulldozing old buildings which lacked essential mod cons and replacing them with new estates, like this one. At Snow Hill, a dozen Georgian terraces were torn down to make way for Bath's one and only tower block. 
And it wasn't just new housing that would later expose the shortcomings of the listing system. It was also the car. As private car ownership exploded, Bath became gridlocked. To solve the problem, the council commissioned the transport guru of the time, Colin Buchanan. But how would he cope with the demands of this historic city? There is a direct clash there between the historic environment, which is really unalterable, and the desires of movement across the same area. Yes, I agree there is a problem here. Buchanan's proposal was nothing if not ambitious. To build a tunnel beneath the centre of Bath. The scheme would remove cars from the heart of the city, but to allow traffic in and out, many listed buildings would have to be demolished. While the council deliberated over this scheme, these houses were effectively condemned and allowed to rot. But the final nail in the coffin for many of Bath's buildings happened in the early 70s. Nine acres of Georgian streets in the Southgate area of the city centre were reduced to rubble to make way for a shopping mall. We had lots and lots of Georgian property, some of it terrible, in very, very bad condition. That was demolished and we bought the original Southgate development there. It seemed the right thing to do to me at the time. Um, and uh, we were going to get a new shiny shopping development. At the time, few people valued the ordinary landscapes of Bath. Most were fixated on the big set pieces. Yet among the local people who lived in the streets being torn down, opposition was growing. One couple began to document the vanishing town. Gosh, and even, even whole, well, I mean, we're building whole terraces like this being demolished. Oh, yes. Yeah. Ruth Cord's husband, Peter, devoted all his spare time to making nearly 2,000 drawings of condemned buildings before they were lost forever. Was it the human quality of the architecture that was disappearing? Mm. And uh, all the, uh, the lesser buildings, it didn't matter how humble they were, they all seemed to have something different about them. The different ornamentation, and different door cases, different doors, different letter boxes, all sorts, everything. It, it was, there wasn't the sameness about it that we see so much now. That everything had character. What are the buildings that were being demolished? What do they add to the town? Well, they were the town, weren't they? I mean, it's, you, they showed the, the way of life of the uh, Georgian population. For many of these ordinary 18th century properties, it was already too late. By the early 70s, more than a thousand Georgian buildings had been demolished. Against the onslaught of modernization, it seemed like the listing system had failed. Finally, in 1973, a campaign to save Bath was kick-started by a journalist who was appalled at what was happening to Britain's most beautiful city. When you actually see the bulldozers at work, when you see the rubble lying around, then you look at the photographs of what used to stand there, because that's all one had then. Um, anger, I suppose, is the, the main thing one felt. And everyone fully appreciated the big set pieces, and they are very lovely. But the idea that the set pieces were losing their frames didn't really register with people until they were being pulled down. But the problem was that uh, Bath had a huge number of houses which were protected, but an even vaster number which should have been and weren't because of the old listening system. With the backing of conservation lobby group, the Bath Preservation Trust, Ferguson wrote a book called The Sack of Bath. It was graphically illustrated with photos of buildings that had been torn down and ones that had replaced them. It caused a sensation. There were extensive articles in the press. 
appeals were launched to raise money for the conservation cause. For the war, Bath was the most beautiful city in England. Even Britain's most famous art historian, Kenneth Clarke, made an impassioned plea. About 20 years ago, the developers moved in and they knocked down whole streets. However, we can stop them. It isn't too late. A lot of Bath is still here. We can stop them with the help of the Bath Preservation Trust. The uproar against new development wasn't confined to Bath. All over the country, alarm bells were ringing over the destruction of old towns and cities. In Cheltenham, Edinburgh and London, people took to the streets in protest. In Bath, the residents won their fight to stop Buchanan's road tunnel. At last, the local authority began to sit up and take notice. The campaign to save Bath was so successful, the council changed tack. Bath's historic buildings were resurveyed, and instead of demolishing buildings like these, they started to do them up. The council even published a book called Saving Bath. With so much of the historic city gone, it became even more important to protect what was left. In 1975, a new list of buildings was published, and it was twice the length of the previous one. The Grade 3 category was abolished, and many of the same buildings were redesignated at Grade 2 level and became protected. But the struggle to save the city was by no means over. In 1987, the city of Bath was awarded UNESCO World Heritage status. Since then, it's become England's most popular tourist destination outside London. Visitors pour £300 million into the local economy every year, and one in ten residents depend on the tourism industry in some way or another. So many people have a vested interest in preserving Bath's buildings, and they can lobby listing body English Heritage to get them protected. An awful lot of our work today is in response to requests from the public for listing to take place. That represents a real shift from past approaches. Today we're much more responsive because anyone can apply for a building to be listed and we deal with several thousand applications a year to do so. Buildings that are nominated by the public often face immediate threat of demolition, so they're in the front line in the war between conservation and development. One recent battle surrounded vacuum cleaner tycoon James Dyson's application to build a college of design and innovation in Bath. I've worked there all my life. I was given my first job as an engineer in Bath, and Bath has a tremendous history of engineering. It's got some very, very successful engineering companies and some very, very good engineering universities, the University of Bath, the University of Bristol, and the University of the West of England. So it's a very good place to, to have an engineering school. In 2004, Dyson chose a riverside location close to the heart of the city to site his college. A disused, unlisted Victorian factory would have to be demolished to make way for it. But the factory, called Newark Works, was by Thomas Fuller, a renowned 19th century architect. And it had played a vital role in the industrialization of Bath. Conservationists launched a campaign to stop Dyson and get the building listed. It's important because um, it's this purpose-built factory, uh, built in an Italianate style, in, in using local stones. People concentrate on the Georgian buildings, but most of us, our forebears, would have worked in places like this. This is much more relevant industrial history to most of the people of Bath and places like the assembly rooms, uh, the Crescent and so on, where rich people lived. This is our history. English heritage was convinced, and before demolition, in December 2006, Newark Works was awarded a Grade 2 listing. Dyson took this into account and adapted his plans to retain the facade and part of the building. But after a delay of nearly two years, a public inquiry was called, citing listed building status as one of its reasons. It had all taken so long 
that in autumn 2008, Dyson abandoned his plans. It deeply upset me, yes, but, and I felt that it was just simply a cop-out. They were frightened to make a decision upon which they might get blamed for whatever reason. Listing is partly responsible for rescuing this building. The survival of Newark Works is a triumph for those who campaign to save it, but the building remains disused and derelict. What's happened highlights a clash between development and conservation in a city with so many historic buildings. In Bath, a tenth of all buildings are listed, and the whole issue of architectural conservation has polarised opinion. What strikes me as odd about Bath, and, and indeed rather worrying, is the, the very forces which made Bath a wonderful place in the 18th century, forces which wanted to encourage development, had a sense of optimism, wanted to you know, stimulate creativity and make things new. Uh, these all seem to be utterly positive forces. These are the very forces which the conservation lobby now seeks to stifle and inhibit. They would rather sit around uh, in their wintry sort of self-regard, uh, you know, smugly uh, you know, anticipating tea with Jane Austen, rather than thinking about a viable future for the city as a, as a living organism. I think the conservation in Bath perform a role of protecting civilization. Bath is a product of a remarkable civilization. It has been under threat for the last half century and more. Uh, the conservation movement in Bath has tried to preserve something of immense value to the world. Cities have got to be dynamic, they've got to be evolving. I mean, the very word culture suggests ideas of growth, change, evolution. And, you know, Bath is quite literally, um, it's cliche to say, but it's true. I mean, Bath is a museum. I don't think Bath is a museum, but there's nothing wrong with it being a museum. There's nothing wrong with it being protected, because unless we put legislation in place to protect it, the barbarians of day will do their best to, to wreck it, as they have systematically over the last 60 years or so. Even by English Heritage's own admission, listing is not a perfect system. But in a complex modern world, where economics and priorities change every day, how could it be? I think there's no doubt that listing is often used as a way of stopping things happening, sometimes stopping good things happening. It also, on the other hand, prevents unsympathetic change. So there are cases when listing is absolutely essential for the preserving of the character and quality of a place or building. Listing was born out of a moment of crisis for Britain, when our architectural treasures were on the brink of being lost. There's no doubt that many brilliant buildings would not be here without listing. The danger is taken too far. Listing can lead to a stagnant mindset, stifling the exhilaration of modern architecture. For a free open university booklet exploring some of the key debates, call 0845 366 8011 or visit bbc.co.uk forward slash saving Britain's past and tell us what you would save as your heritage. And Saving Britain's Past continues with a visit to the most controversial listed building. That's next Monday at 7.30 here on BBC Two. On the way next, a clash of the intellectuals in University Challenge. <laughs> Are you interested in singing, sir? No, I'm not at all, mate. You're all right. One's a solo. No. No. <laughs> no, not me! Anyone at all from South Oxy. Yeah, fantastic. Two's a duet. Oh. But can a whole community... Yeah. OK. Give That's a, a yes. Yeah. Become a choir. I'm sure that this fella Gareth is good at his job. It's a really good turnout. But no one around here does any singing. The question is, can I handle them? The Choir, Unsung Town, Tuesday the 1st of September on BBC Two. At TV Licensing, our technology lets you pay your license in the way that suits you best. You can pay yearly, monthly by direct debit, or weekly by cash or online. Visit our website to find out more. tvlicensing.co.uk
Britain's connections to the fjords of Norway. Coast is tomorrow night at 8 here on BBC Two. But back to tonight 